Standoff between Russia and Ukraine continues to intensify. So why does it matter to U.S. national security? And after dismissing President Trump's Abraham Accords, is the Biden administration doing an about face? To discuss, let's bring in the former chief of staff to the National Security Council at the White House under President Trump, Fred Flights. Fred, good to see you. Good to be here. Fred, so this situation continues to intensify. Secretary Blinken met with Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday on the heels of President Biden's mixed messaging about what would trigger an aggressive U.S. response. How do you view the situation as it stands now? Well, the negotiations were interesting, and it was quite a mismatch. Uh, Sergei Lavrov has been foreign minister for 18 years and Antony Blinken spent most of his career as an aide to Joe Biden. And you could see the difference. Lavrov pushed for some interesting things. He wanted a written response from the U.S. to Russia's security concerns. The Biden administration initially said no. Then they said, well, we'll give it to you, but we want it to be secret. And the Russians said, no, we're going to publish it. And I might add, why would the Biden administration want this to be secret? Because it doesn't want the American people to know what concessions it's offering. Lavrov also said he wants all foreign troops out of Bulgaria and Romania. This is simply something he can give away in exchange for more concessions on Ukraine. He's a very savvy negotiator, and he saw such weakness in uh, Biden's press conference. I think it has emboldened him to press for things like this. Fred, the, the U.S. is now uh, sending weapons to Ukraine from other countries. It's a U.S.-made weapons uh, that they, we've given permission to, uh, to funnel into Ukraine. We're going to be providing, uh, for lack of a better term, sur surplus equipment to the U Ukrainians. But it doesn't really seem, as you were pointing out, that there's a, a coherent strategy here, or certainly not a strategy, an offensive strategy, that matches some of the tough rhetoric that we're hearing out of Washington. That's right. The U.S. has been reluctant to send lethal aid into Ukraine, unlike President Trump, who did send this aid in. Some aid is coming in now, uh, lethal military aid. Uh, the idea is to make it much more costly for the Russians to invade. And I think it's part of this incoherent policy by the Biden administration. And the Biden administration also has given Germany a veto over what aid goes to Ukraine. The Germans don't want lethal aid in Ukraine, and we've been deferring to them instead of leading. Instead of making a, a, a basic determined decision as, as, the, as the world's leading power, the world's only superpower, that we'll take a stand here, we're letting the Germans have a veto over our foreign policy. Talk to us a little bit more about that, Fred. Why would, why would the U.S. give Germany the upper hand here in, in dictating our own strategy? Biden is a, someone who goes by the foreign policy establishment book. Everything has to be multilateral. We don't do things unilaterally. He consults with the Europeans. He's proud to be a member of the European club. I don't want the United States to be a member of the European club or the, or, or the UN club. We have to make decisions sometimes because it's the right thing to do and not to let these people in the establishment decide what our policy is. But that's the way Joe Biden does things. Yeah, and the, U, the, the EU club or the European club is a mess. Uh, they, they can't, they, they, there is no cohesion between that group, and uh, they're certainly not going to do anything without strong U.S. leadership. So, Fred, you know that both the White House and the Republicans are looking at the polling data here. Intervention in Ukraine, not exactly a popular proposition right now with the American people. Talk to us about why Ukraine and Russia's moves matter for the United States. They matter because we don't want to see nations violating international law and forcibly taking over a democratic state. But we also have to recognize that we don't want the United States to be involved in unnecessary wars. We don't want to do something that would spark a war between the United States and Russia. This is a difficult thing to balance. There are some in Congress who are saying that we should help the Ukrainians take back Crimea. Uh, there, there are a small number of congressmen who think there should be U.S. troops in Ukraine. Look, we don't want Ukraine invaded, but we have to draw the line about keeping America out of areas where there are no strategic U.S. interests. Let's support the Ukrainians with diplomacy, with economic sanctions against Russia, but no, no, use, of military, no use of U.S. military power. Just playing devil's advocate, even though there may not be specific U.S. interests with respect to Ukraine, allowing this type of behavior where you have an authoritarian country allowed to march across the border, doesn't that, if that happens, 
and we allow it to happen, doesn't that embolden China? Because they've got territory that they've got their eye on, too. We can't let it be easy for Russia to do this, but we're not the world's policemen. Are we going to send in 100,000 troops to Ukraine to stop the Russians? Would, would that stop the Russians? I would say, no, Russia is a nuclear power. But you're right, the way we handle this or the way we mishandle this will send a signal to China. And I think China's already emboldened mm -hmm. uh, to invade yeah. Taiwan. I believe that the, the date of that invasion has been moved up already because of Biden's incompetence. Now, there seems to be a reticence to take preemptive steps, ramping up sanctions now. And again, these are all ways to avoid a military conflict. Uh, being more specific, we keep on hearing about high costs, being more specific about the high costs that the president uh, referenced this week. Do you think that it's time to kind of lay these things out and do some things preemptively to try again to push back against, uh, against Putin? I think lethal aid was a good way to go, but I think a better way to go would be to name a much more senior official to negotiate one-on-one -on -one with the Russians. Stop the public threats, the public ultimatums. We have to get together in a room and have some real negotiations on how to deal with this. Maybe we could say, we'll put off talking about NATO membership for Ukraine for five years. That might help cool things down. Uh, but I, I think sending Blinken out and, and, and Kamala Harris and Joe Biden making all these threats of sanctions that we're probably not going to keep, that's just undermining American credibility on the world stage. Well, of course, the Congress could also act in some fashion to send a very strong message as well. Um, well, I wanted to get to the Abraham Accords. I'm told that I have to wrap. So the next time we have you on, I, th I want to talk about your piece where the, the Biden administration is actually now starting to embrace President Trump's policy uh, on the Abraham Accords in the Middle East. As always, Fred Flights, thanks for your insights. We appreciate you being here. Good to here. be here.